Peace family, welcome to another episode of Underground Railroad Productions. This is your host, Brother Rich. I'm in the building with Blue Pillar. Mr. 44. Peace family. Mr. 44, today is Hip Hop's uh, 44th birthday, so I had to yes, get you is. here, brother. Yes, it is. Happy Born Day, happy solo return to Hip Hop. And it's interesting, on the year it turns 44, is the year that it becomes the biggest seller genre in the U.S. 2017, Forbes reported a couple yes. of weeks ago. Yes, indeed. Not only has it been designated as the biggest sellers, the biggest, the biggest selling genre in the U.S., it also has a clip: "Rock and Roll is the most influential music of all time." You know what I'm saying? So it's right. the biggest global phenomena, and um, as we have explained uh, many times. You know, in our presentations, and uh, we laid out in the 444 decoded last night with our brother Raku. Um, Kabbalistically, the number that we get from hip hop is 432, and that's the same number as the world. You know, so there's a natural correspondence. You know, what I'm saying that this this number that corresponds with world is also the world music. It's the most dominating music. Scientific studies have shown that it is the most influential, it's the most dominating music that this world has ever seen. So in its 44th year of existence, it has come into itself. You know what I'm saying? This is his glory days, and it's evidenced by all of the homage that was paid to it today. You know what I'm saying? Especially on the front page of Google. Who do you admire? When you look at hip hop, it being forty-four years old, you know it's a it's a phenomenon. It dominates the markets, billion-dollar industry. Who do you look at in hip hop as representing for the culture? You know, whether you have some disagreements with how they move or not. I mean, like a person like Diddy is he somebody that you look at like he's holding it down for the culture? Who do you look at look at like that? Jay, you know who? Um. You know, without any prejudice because of my preference for the number 44, I would have to say Jay-Z because of the fact that he embodies the story of hip-hop somewhat perfectly. You know what I'm saying? The fact that, you know, when we think about hip-hop, you know, in order to hop, you have to have two legs. You know, unless you are <laughs> hopping around on one leg, you know. Right. So hip-hop is comprised of these 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 two these two legs and and one leg would be party and bullshit you know party music and the other leg would be social commentary so this year in the 44th year of hip hop you know seeing it come full circle you know what i'm saying not only with Jay-Z's demonstration but look at the expression that we saw just a week ago when Kid Creole from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five gets arrested on 44th and 3rd, you know, and his brother, his blood brother, uh, Melly Mel, was responsible by way of Silver Rob Sylvia Robinson and um, Sugar Hill Records for coming out with the message. So he personified and his group personified, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the party, you know, they was all into party music and then... Uh, it was suggested by their label head that they make this song about social commentary. Melly Mel didn't initially want to do it, but he went ahead and do, did it, and it became a hit. And that opened up the lane, you know, for what we had uh, or, or what we have experienced by way of consciousness coming through the music. You know what I'm saying? So your public enemies, your BDPs, your KRS, and um, oh, KRS is BDP, right? My bad. You know, but rock hymns of the world and, you know, even to some degree, as we showed yesterday with the uh, progression chart of hip hop, N.W.A. initially when he came out with their protest music. So the embodiment of or the opening up of that particular avenue, right, these twin towers of hip hop, you know, and then even when we think about hip hop in an inception, we think about Bambada and we think about Herc. You know what I'm saying? It's always had this dualistic nature, all right? So with someone like Jay-Z coming into their maturity, okay, becoming the elder statesman of hip-hop and advancing the genre to a place where 
it's not only just talking about party music, but it becomes socially responsible, especially in the vein of family, of being a family man and, and saying, look, you know, this is not only how we should put on for our babies and our children, especially for those of us that were abandoned by, you know, either our fathers or, you know what I'm saying? And somebody like an Eminem's case, you know, you know, had a, a very tumultuous relationship with their mother, but also, you know, let's leave a legacy, you know what I'm saying? And let's be owners of this genre. You know, we've been partying for too long. So when I see someone like Jay, uh, you know, demonstrating for 20 plus years, you know what I'm saying? Not only as a mogul, but also as an artist, I would have to say, yes, I respect him somewhat more so than I would look at a Diddy to say, look, he's not only advanced in the culture with his, uh, you know, with his business moves and, you know, his, his dominance over the genre in regards to saying people look up to him and, you know what I mean, he can move this this way or move that that way, but also, you know, the lyricism, you know what I'm saying? Dude was just inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame and he don't write songs, you know what I'm saying? So these are profound things that we can look at knowing where this individual comes from. Okay, and being able to uh, embrace an art form that was created for individuals such as itself, you know what I'm saying? The, uh, the, 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 the stone that the builders rejected, and now look, you know what I'm saying? It's a smooth ash law, you feel me? So it's a beautiful thing. Hip hop being a <clears throat> black culture, how do you feel about somebody like Jimmy Iovine who has been so influential in the culture, has worked with some of the biggest names, whether it's Dre, whether it's 50 Cent, whether it's Eminem. What's your take on Jimmy Iovine? Do you view him as a culture vulture? Do you view but him... When you yeah. say hip-hop is a black culture, can you qualify that? When I say black culture, what I mean is that it's created by... From 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 black people, from what we went through, from creating nothing into something, it's our lifestyle, how we walk, how we talk, how you dress right now says hip hop, how you act says hip hop. That's something that came straight from the ghetto in America, right. the black so, ghettos in America. Culturally, we're saying okay, it's mainly influenced the nuances and and you know the 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 style and what have you would be mainly influenced by quote unquote inner city youth and in particular because we're talking about its inception point New York we would have to say right for lack of better term black and brown which means uh, melanated and quote unquote Latino you understand how corruptible this language is but right, right, you know what I'm right, talking about right 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 so you know and then we gotta remember it was taken downtown you know what I'm saying? And it was embraced by the rejects of that society. And this is according to the documentaries that I've watched. This is according to the first-hand accounts that I have from people that were there, that were involved with the genre or what have you. Um, I think that, you know, hip-hop is a, a, a very unique American art form because it represents the juncture point of where both of those cultures somewhat meet and exchange culture is the interchangeable aspects of what came directly after integration you know what I'm saying so it's like you know the house was open and Negroes went into that house and they deposited something and they left with something else because the 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 main customer base of hip hop is not necessarily the inner city youth. So the consumer base of hip hop is primarily white America, quote unquote. You feel me? So there goes the, the particular exchange. And when it came to business, yes, they took their business to the, uh, the Jews downtown or the Italians who had the strongholds in the music industry. You know, um, I was reading the Google page earlier and they had Laya Cohen up there, you know what I'm saying, who's now the head of um, YouTube Music, you know what I'm saying, or he has a very high position over there, and he was explaining his story, how he got on, you feel me, and he was laying out, you know what I'm saying, and he got put on when he started doing club, uh, 
club venues and, and he brought Run DMC in. They was one of the first acts. And then Russell put him on as a road manager and he worked his way in and Russell put Rick Rubin on. You feel me? So all of these people were put on to help advance the genre to a particular place where it could be commercialized. And there was a, a, a conscious intent to do that. You know what I'm saying? This was not a plot or a plan. Like they didn't take anything from anyone. They wanted to get it through certain doors and get it to certain places. So they utilized these people who, you know, because of the influence of hip hop and what it represents, it is able to captivate people from any walk in any genre. You know what I'm saying? The music speaks to people in a particular way and they want to participate with the culture and do what they can. Of course, if you have your back turns and your guards down, more than likely it's going to be a level of exploitation taking place. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be, you know, anyone and everyone is going to go for theirs. You know what I'm saying? And hip hop, unfortunately, doesn't have any defense system. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we don't have no natural uh, antibodies against invaders. You know what I'm saying? Because I guess, you know, the whole aspect and energy of celebration, you're not expecting or looking for anybody to come into your venue while you celebrate and then pee in your corner. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Write graffiti on your bathroom and. You know what I'm saying? Remove precious things from the house. But that's exactly what takes place when no one's looking. So hip hop would be no different from any other black form of art that has been exploited through the times. You know what I'm saying? And our failures to know and understand how history repeats itself renders us in this place where we want to play the victim about, yo, this person got this and that person got that. So Iveen has been... Um, very instrumental at key juncture points of, of you know, of, of, of hip hop for taking it particular places and making multi-millions off of it, but also making multi-million dollar or multi making multi-millionaires out of the people that he did business with. You know what I'm saying? And I heard an interview with him when he was on Sway and Sway was like, yo, do y'all think at Interscope that you could have done more for the inner city. You know what I'm saying? You made hundreds of millions of dollars. Could you have given back? And he was like, yo, quite honestly, to tell you the truth, you know, that's not our job. Like, I didn't even see that responsibility as ours. You know what I'm saying? In so many words, if I'm making multi-millionaires out of the melanated black people I'm doing business with, that's their job. You feel me? I'm here doing business. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was like, I guess because the doc was coming out, he said, now that we look back on it, we wish we could have done more. But at the time, it wasn't a thought of ours. You know, we, we're sending Suge Knight a $150 million check. You know what I'm saying? Now he said, whatever Dr. Dre wants to do, I'm behind him 100%. If he say cut the check, we'll cut the check. You know what I'm saying? They went into Compton and they built the school and everything. But... These businesses don't feel like they have no culpability to these environments or these communities that they are mining black diamonds from. Okay? That's just the nature of the business. When you look at TV and these documentaries, and we think about, you know, hip hop in the eighties and and we when we and we when we see the breakdancing and the graffiti, and you look at how it's such a a huge culture overseas. The I mean, the the, the break dancing with a lot of uh, the Asian brothers over there. They in, in Las Vegas. What's the name of the group? Jabberwockies. Yeah, Jabberwockies. Jabberwockies. They have a, they have yeah, a residency. residency. They yeah. do. They do their thing. They nice <laughs> with it. They Stupid nice with nice, it in yeah. Vegas. So, how do you feel coming from the inner city and you see everybody overseas benefiting from the break dancing? And it seems as though the 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 black and brown people in America. We invent something, then we leave it and go on to the next thing. Whether it's like slang, said, whether yeah. it's dancing. Our, our, our refusal or inability to see the value in the things that we create renders us, again, in a position where we have to point fingers now and play victims because other people from other cultures have been reared and raised to see the value in things where they don't exist and definitely identify them where they do exist. So, yeah, they're going to see it for what it is and they're going to run with it like, oh, you leaving diamonds on the floor? Let me pick this up, polish it off, you know what I'm saying? And, 
and I'm going to do whatever. You feel me? So this is what we're seeing. But also, like I said, someone such as myself, if I understand that hip hop is a a global art form, it corresponds with the number world. Yes, it's going to be a world phenomena and other people in other places dealing with different circumstances are going to treat the art form differently you know what i'm saying they're going to see it for what it's worth this is my ticket i'm going to make it work and they're paying homage to the gods as well so they got to be twice as nice they got to be three times as nice you feel me if they're going to be participants in a genre that they feel that the gods have created they got to be twice as nice three times as nice and you go around the world and you find this with these individuals you feel me that's how Eminem even got in the game. He felt like he had to be three times as nice as what was on the market at the particular time. If I'm a, even be in the same room with the guards, I got to be twice or three times or four times as nice or on par. You know what I'm saying? So these people take the craft that much more serious. Some of us might become slightly lackadaisical. You know what I'm saying? And this person all of a sudden is passing you because a company, especially a company that sees marketing and the potential to market to a populace because they know who's buying the records. They know who has, you know what I'm saying? They know what the population uh, disparities are in this country. So they know that, you know, you, you represent 44 million of the population and they represent 360 million. They're buying 90% of the music and coming to 70% of the concerts. Yeah, they're going to give a record deal to an artist that looks like these people to see how this shit works. And if it works, then it becomes a cookie cutter model that they want to replicate over and over. But if these quote unquote white artists keep showing up and they have a, a skill set, this says, wow, this person has a particular talent where not only the fans are responding, but also people in their peer group are saying, yo, son is nice for a white boy. Then again, you know, we, 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 we give so much away. You feel me? We're so kind hearted. You know what I mean? Or we, we want to keep it real so bad. That we don't understand the value of our cosign. You dig? So, yeah, it 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 it, it lends credence to people who know how to market that cosign. You feel me? The Jabberwockies of the world that run right to, you know, these particular venues and be like, look, such and such said we was nice. You know what I'm saying? You know, but they was in their heart, they was just giving it up because that's the thing that you do in hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, I got to give it up. Some was, yeah, y'all did y'all thing. But now they really, really doing their thing. So I watched the Red Bull competitions. It's in Russia. It's in France. It's in China. They getting busy around the world. You feel me? Earlier today, I was on a train, and this has been going on for the last three years in the summertime when I'm on the train. You know, the train break dancers get on. You feel me? And um, shout out, I had ran into a brother earlier um, in the um, herb store in Lower Manhattan. His name was a Positive Brother. So I'll give you the backstory before I get to what happened with him. I'm on the train, you know, um, in my mind thinking about this whole tribute that Google just did for hip hop. You know, they had an interactive app on Google where you can DJ, you could mix on Google with the records and everything. And that was amazing because I've always wanted to DJ. So I'm thinking about this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the 44s and 444 decoded and everything. And on the train, young man comes, he puts his radio down, train starts moving, of course he starts getting busy, doing the dancing, you know what I'm saying? Like, Jumping, you know, using the poles to really demonstrate his agility and his ability to um, hold postures and the symmetry of his body. He was just like son killed it in under two minutes. He did some shit that a person probably would have to practice 20 or 30 years. Like, you know, what I'm saying Europeans would go to Broadway and spend hundreds of dollars to see this on some Alvin Ailey type shit. And these individuals, these young brothers is on the train giving it up. Every single day in New York City like this, passing around a hat for, for, for pennies and change. You understand? 
Um, and I'm like, damn, look at all this talent. Look how the culture has continued in the, uh, you know, in, 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 in the DNA of, of these young brothers and some of these young sisters throughout the city. And I have asked plenty of these crews, like, yo, do you know such and such? These crews don't even know one another. You understand? They're very sporadically, uh, uh, you know, placed throughout the city, and they just target the trains to get their little change and what have you. So I get off the train, I go. While I'm headed to my destination, I run into this young brother who's in the same store as me, and he tells me he watches the video, watches the videos, and he's been inspired because he's a, a, a older brother who used to dance. So he's been going around the city and organizing all of these different groups that dance on the train so he could petition New York City to get some of this tourism money, you feel me, to recognize the fact that, look, we've been intricate, intricate, intricately involved with the entertainment right on 42nd Street since the 80s. And this is what I was saying in my lecture last night. Like, look, hip-hop and, four and the Deuce got an intimate relationship. Times Square, we got an intimate relationship with them. You know what I'm saying? Like, We've been providing free entertainment for the main tourist attraction in the city. Tourism in the city is a, I, I don't have the exact figure in my mind, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So if people are coming around the world to New York City, they should be coming to see the highlights of what the city has to offer. And what this city has produced in the streets and the slums of the city is hip hop, a trillion dollar art form. You understand? The preeminent art form on the planet at this particular time. So how does hip-hop benefit from the tourism dollars that are coming into this city? You understand? They don't. Shout out to, uh, I know, uh, the brother um, Cass. He had a, 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 tour, a tourist uh, company where he was taking people around. You know, they came in and when we used to hustle out there on 2-5th, he used to bring them to the Apollo. And I think he would bring them up to 1520 Sedwick and other places throughout the city. You know what I mean? But this should be something that is um, definitely more prominently advertised for all of the tourism dollars that's coming in to the city. Like, it's millions that can be made. You know what I mean? And these entertainers, these young men that are on these subway trains dancing for pennies and dollars, they should be seeing some real bread because they are extraordinary with their skill set. You dig what I'm saying? So once again, it's the level of accessibility. It's the level of limited resources. We're almost right back where we started when hip hop started in 1973. What's fuck with that? In a city like New York, you understand? Where we have access to almost anything. We should be able to walk into any one of these venues. You know what I mean? We got social media. We got all of these things. Yet, our talent, you know what I'm saying? Our diamonds in the rough are back on the train dancing for pennies and dollars. 44 years of hip-hop. We're now in 2017. What do you think about the female rapper's contribution to hip hop throughout all these years. I mean, it, it, it seems blue, it, it seems as though there's only room for one or two female MC at a time in the mainstream. It seems as though for some reason, we can't have five popping female MCs at one time. You know, there's a Kim, there's a Foxy, there's a Nikki, there's a Lauren, there's always one or two circling at the time. Why do you why do you think that is? Is it a masculine uh, culture? Because of, you know, um, again, when when we when we drew the chart up for hip hop, you know, we saw that there was an energy in hip hop that's very misogynistic, you know, as evidenced by the chart. And of course, we can utilize all of the examples to what we see, you know, what I'm saying throughout these forty four years in existence. Um, so I, I can just point to the chart and say it's the energy of the creation of hip hop that has dictated how, you know, it has treated not only women, but not only women in terms of, you know, the fan base, but also the entertainers. But we can just 
also back up a little bit and just say, you know, based on what we see in society, the whole societal structure of, you know, I mean, the, the women have always been somewhat subjugated at the bottom of the caste of this society and also in our society, quote unquote, black America, unfortunately, you know, we haven't gave her that stage. We really haven't prepared ourselves to hear her voice. You know what I'm saying? She's on the bottom. You know, so hip hop is, is has not been kind to female artists. You know what I'm saying? It's not only been advertised as a as a young man sport, but more specifically as a man sport. You know what I'm saying? So the the women are always looked at as the exception, like, okay, well what she got? What's she bring to the table? And now it's hypersexualized. So, you know, the well, whole Well let me ask you this, Bloom. Mm -hmm. As a as a as a as a young man, you was in your I would say you was in your twenties when Little Kim came out. Was you in your twenties? Late late yeah, yeah, late teens, twenties. Okay, late teen twenties. So as a brother at that age, and you could kind of look back look back at it from then to now, you know, little Kim gets accused of, you know, the, her over sexualization and she was raw and she was raunchy yes, and her was. poses, you know, remember the her first pose with her legs cocked. I do. <laughs> I had a poster of that in my room. You're I think there. she had the cheetah print on or something like that, yes, right? She did. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about hardcore, right? Right, yeah, hardcore, exactly. Um, you know, women are often they're taught not that they're not supposed to be sexual. That's they're supposed to hide the fact that they get horny. So we've always had this perception when we were young, like women don't get horny. Then when we got older, we like, yo, they just as horny as we are. If so, not more. If right. not more. But we don't realize that. Till we interact with them and we get older and we have that experience. But based on society, you would think they never got horny back in the day. Yes. So do you think Little Kim, it wasn't that she was over-sexualized. She provided a more realistic view of how women think? I think, yeah. She expressed or represented at that particular time somewhat of a cultural revolution. A revolt against the constraints that society had put on sexuality you know because we was just coming through the rocket three-fourths of cloth never showing your stuff off boo right right you know exactly. what i'm saying we yeah, had just yeah. came through a lot of that so even as i explained uh in 444 decoded with big and um puff represented when they came into hip-hop was more of a christian catholic energy that hadn't been seen in hip-hop that kind of like signaled the ending of the reign of Islam in hip-hop. You know what I'm saying? It had been dominated in the late 80s coming up to the mid-90s by Islamic values somewhat, you know what I'm saying? Like that five-pointed star energy. And then when Big and Puff came in and they initiated this, yeah, the Jesus pieces, they were both Roman Catholic um, students or what have you. It was more of a materialistic, uh, you know, free for all somewhat kind of energy but it also represented a conversation that was not only taking place in the streets but also a demonstration that was also taking place you know what i'm saying behind closed doors so little kim kind of personified and represented what she was seeing in her environment you know remember and also biggie smalls wrote those rhymes so these were people that they were because I was around the same people at the same time, and you know, shorties was taking it in the buns, and th things of that nature were taboo at the time. But it's not as if it wasn't happening. And remember, I went to school. Well, I had, I was going to Brooklyn College, and Kim was going to uh, BCA Brooklyn College Academy, which was like a remedial high school at the time. So I'm going to school with her. I'm going to school with Kim. I mean, I'm going to school with Foxy. Like I knew what these young ladies was doing in the back staircase. I know how they was getting down. So their personification on wax was somewhat true to what they were doing. You know what I'm saying? To be part of the conversation. You understand? So um, I, I think that they're all, that on one hand, there was a level of exploitation. You understand? By the men that were around them, they knew that the sex would sell. And they knew what brothers kind of was wanting to hear and was ready to hear because this is all coming out of the Snoop era as well. That terraformed society in regards to the conversation that was willing, that people were willing to have. 
on some New York shit because look, prior to Kim and prior to Foxy, see the way, the way that West Coast men deal and respond to women and feminine energy on the West Coast is totally different than how it's dealt with on the East Coast the only thing and in I, the Midwest the only as well. The thing I remember is Lady of Rage from the West Coast. Back in the day, I okay. remember Lady of Rage, yeah. Right. So, on some too short shit, you know, a West Coast, Midwest, and in the South is real quick to call a woman a bitch. Like, they got a whole different type of vibration on the word for it. Bitch. Like, that's where pimping is heavy at. You understand? So, they quick to put their pimp the hand down. So, the subjugation of the woman, men being on top of women in regards to the level of subjugation of masculinity and suppression was much more real in the West, in the Midwest, and in the South. Back East, right, where it was more a little bit more liberal-minded, this was, who you calling the bitch, right? Women had a different level of authority on the East Coast, and it was only relegated to East Coast because, or even certain parts of the East Coast, because this is the only part of America where you see the, the, the coalescing of different kinds of quote-unquote black people, right? Caribbean, right? They come from the North. They're a little bit more sophisticated up here. So the way that black men, quote-unquote, dealt with black women, this is where the intelligentsia is at. This is where, you know what I'm saying, people is dealing with high levels of information and intelligence and stuff like that. So the way that they dealt with their woman is somewhat different. The way that they saw women was somewhat different on the East Coast Prior to her coming with that particular stance, that was not the conversation that was being had over here. So she broke that particular taboo with a, a, a cultural, quote-unquote, revolution against whatever that status quo was at the present time. And the way that women responded to it, okay, it's the same shit. Like when they come out of the church, right, and then the motherfucking skirts get hiked up, they put them heels on, and they a whole different person than they are when they sitting in them pews, that's what you saw, right? They broke outside of the mold of the constraints that these people with their ideologies were putting on women who wanted to express themselves. Now, you know, whether they wanted to go all the way to the till like that, I don't necessarily know. But I do know that women wanted to have the freedom to do it if they wanted to. You understand? And that's what she represented. And that's why she was received so well. You know? Indeed, indeed, indeed. And, and you also have to put on record that her energy was juxtaposed at the time where you still had Lauren Hill over here. Right, right, right. You right, understand? Right. So that's interesting. Indeed, indeed. Um, you know, when we think about hip hop in the 90s and early 2000s, before the internet really, really took over, we really thinking about record labels and we're thinking about, you know, the Rockefellers and the Def Jams and the Bad Boys and the Loud and, you know, or Death Row or, you know, any other record label that was out there, Rap A Lot or any other uh, record label that was out there at the time. And you hear all the stories about these contracts and artists getting ripped off and getting taken advantage of. And we live in this new era where, you know, labels are kind of non-existent at this point. Uh, you know, to the extent it was before. But the thing that's strange is that although we're like, yo, the gatekeepers are gone. You know, your music get heard by millions. You don't need the gatekeepers. They won't hold you back anymore. But it seems as though we got better music with the gatekeepers that were doing all these bad things with the back and I'm, with the bad contracts. Seems as though we got better music back then. And now that the gatekeepers are gone, we don't really get, we don't get the DMXs, we don't get the, the crews, we don't really get what we got back then right now, Blue. Right. So is there a connection the between the barriers all that? down and the gatekeepers are removed and the right. gate is open, where's right. all the talent? Right, that we've been saying that. <laughs> right, that, they, that we've been saying has been suppressed. Yo, they built the wall, son. The nicest niggas is behind that wall. They got these few dudes over here that they got everybody looking at. It's only four or five of them. You know what I'm saying? And it's a million bucks. But well, once they knock the wall down, what happened? Where they at? So labels, you know, had a system. And that particular system was following the formula that 
through time has somewhat proven to be a, a proven formula. You know what I mean? You got management, you got A&Rs, you know, and every label did not have the best management and every label did not have the best A&Rs. You feel me? But something happened, and that's a good question. You know what I mean? Where, because there have been people that even worked in the industry that know the dynamics of how that machine works. That now that the, the, the game's supposed to be free reign, how come they haven't taken that talent, right? into the quote-unquote free world and develop these artists in the same way, independently. You really don't see it outside of what you probably saw with Chance the Rapper. And the jury's still out on that because, you know, people are saying that he's a, a, a industry mole, like he's been planted or what have you. <laughs> and they got people behind him, you know what I'm saying, that are pulling strings to make it appear as if he's independent. They were saying the same thing about Macklemore. Right, right, So right, right. if you're not willing to do the work, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. You know, can you achieve what this game has to offer in regards to, you know, superstardom or, or stardom or internet? You know what I mean? Like, can you break the mold and become that dude? Because technically what they're saying is everything is available for you to do that, but it's hard to break through. When I was at Epic and we were working with Nipsey, you know, this was at the, the, the beginning of the internet age. You know what I'm saying? But Nipsey had a strong internet following. You know what I'm saying? Right. And he somewhat kind of knew how to work that internet following. So you see with him, he's one of the rare artists that have been able to independently break the mold and say, look, I'm going to sell $100 CDs and, you know what I'm saying, I'm going to develop merch and I'm going to put tours together myself. And he's been one of the rare ones that have been able to break the mold and still be consistent enough independently to move units and stay relevant and have a strong fan base enough to say, look, I can put music out when I want. You know, Tech Nine, we have to mention him as well. Indeed, yeah. This is somebody who definitely broke the mold. I was watching the Vice episode about it's a um a uh, uh, a white cowboy dude out of Tennessee, Mike something. You know what I mean? He said he moved two million units independently, and he was still utilizing the old Southern model and the and the Western model of going out of the trunk. You know what I mean? I grew up reading the Source magazine where I used to read about JT Bigger Figure. You know what I'm saying? And, and J.O. Felony and these dudes. You know, majority of these dudes in the Bay in particular. You know, the Mac Dre's of the world. These dudes was, oh, the, uh, the E-40s of the world. You feel me? Going out of the trunk. Going gold and platinum. You know, hood gold. I mean, going gold and hood platinum out of the trunk in their hood. You know what I'm saying? These were models that they perfected and have been replicated. And then you go to the South with your rap a lots and, and, you know what I'm saying, your, um, your suave house and what have you. And, you know, cash money before they became on the major, you know, and all of these dudes and, and No Limit and everybody else has perfected the independent model. So saying all of that, right, when, when the game was terrestrial, they perfected it and mastered it. But now that the game is digital, where are these success stories? Where are these models? You feel me? Where's the boosty of the internet? You know what I mean? But the internet is not about, about, about moving units. So somebody could say, well, Lil Uzi Vert is the boosty of the internet. You know what I mean? He got the 30 million, the 40 million, the 50 million views. But digitally, people have not yet perfected how do you translate digital views to digital dollars? So we are at an infancy stage of, you know, a, a new frontier, a new game, a new part of how the game is being played. And the artists have to figure out how they're going to get this bread and how they're going to flip, you know what I'm saying, their talent into dollars before the labels figure it out. Because it's going to be a whole nother form of quote-unquote slavery that they're going to come with. I got two more questions for you, Blue. Um, I'm trying to think which one should I ask first. Let me ask this. Uh, why don't you, th why does it, it, it seems to me, just, you know, you, you analyze life. You, you know, you, I have 30, 35 years of experience down here. I'm 35. Uh, I've noticed since I was young, my people don't like Paying for music. When it was on cassettes, I remember we used to uh, uh, record from the radio, 
press record and play at the same time and record from the radio the song when it was on CD, you try to, you know, do what you do with the CD. Rip it, right. Rip it. Then Napster. Remember Napster came out? I remember Napster. So, you know, they say, you know, white people are the, you know, they spend the most money on hip hop. It's not like black people don't listen to hip hop. Right. It just seems they don't as though it. They don't everybody it. I know doesn't purchase it. Right. And I think about when I go to Nick Games and I think about, you know, how people of other coaches, they always have the jersey on or the team they're watching. They always have the jersey, the hat, the scarf. Um, a handkerchief. All that. And I'm like, yo. They got the big hand. Yeah, the big hand. They, the, they got the foam hand. Yo. They got the hat. Yo, and I'm like. like they got the scarf. It's summertime. They got the scarf. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like. what? <laughs> t- talk to me about the psychology of the inner city youth or just, you know, urban America that we just don't think like that, Blue. I mean, it comes down to the cost versus model. I mean, oh. cost versus value model. And, and I know, real quick, I'm sorry. The first thing the people, when the common sex would say, well, we don't have as much money as them. That's the first thing they would say. So I'm sure you have to address that. Whether that's a lie or that's just a continued like excuse said, or not. Yeah. It comes down to the cost versus value model. You know what I'm saying? You're going to pay the cost for what you value. All right? Again, because it's ours or so we feel, we don't value it as much. Right, because it's always be okay. That I like. Like okay. I said, okay. if we look at hip hop for what it is, and people are gonna be, you know, more than likely in the comment section in their feelings. I said it's an intersection, right, between you coming into somebody else's house, right? That was on fire. You became the fireman. You know what I mean? You put the fire out. You know, you saw pictures of the, uh, the, the, you know, of the house how it used to be. The shit had TVs in it and everything. So you wanted everything that was in the house. And you were willing to do whatever you had to do to get what was in the house. Now, the people that, you know, you came into their Airbnb and shit. So when you left your bags around and you went out to work or you went jogging to the gym or whatever, they went through your bags and the shit that you had in your bags, they lend value to that. Like, oh, shit, where does this come from? You know, this music, we've never heard this before. We, we, this is different. You know what I'm saying? It's something different, something exotic. Something that's coming from the inner city or the slums, if the Europeans can pay for an experience, right, and not have to physically experience it, they value that. Because quietly and secretly, right, this is an American art form. They want to experience the totality of Americanism. All right? Our people have not yet figured out what the hell is going on. So we're not lending the same level of value to that in which we feel that because we're a part of you know, oh, that's that's such and such in them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of them don't need my bread. I know how to get that. You know what I mean? They're going to go to Hollywood and blow up on me anyway and call me an animal. And, and So, <laughs> like, if, if that's continuously being expressed and, and, you know what I mean, because hip-hop is a braggadocious art form, you know, it's about look at what I got and you don't got this. You know what I mean? So supporting an artist with your hard-earned dollars, if that artist is going to turn around and use that support against you, you feel me? You have a tendency to be like, I'm with the shits. Like, I want to be part of this experience, but I'm not necessarily going to buy into it. You know what I'm saying? Especially if I can get it how I get it. You dig what I'm saying? We haven't necessarily been trained to support one another in that way. But like I said, the difference is that in the Midwest, in the West, in the South, that's not true. Because if them artists was going gold in the hood, in the hood. and hood platinum, and they was hood rich, that was from hand-in-hand sales. That was from terrestrial sales. So. They probably wasn't, and I don't know, you know, once they put them, because remember, I lived through No Limit. I lived through cash money. You talking about albums that was coming out every single week. Right, right. Platinum. You understand? I was like, yo, son got eight albums. He had the pen and pixel ads on the back. Son had eight albums coming out. Where they do that at? They was doing their numbers. So I think that, and because you saw them people still in their hood, you saw them people giving back. You feel me? Their experience was real. To be like, yo, that's my cousin and them. Even if they're going to go, 
you know, uptown and by a mansion, they still was in Calio. They still came back to Magnolia. They still was part of that element. They still was part of that fabric. So I think that they were more successful with selling it, you know, facing them was still in the third ward. Um, Mac Dre and them was still in their hood. You know what I mean? New Yorkers, they go Hollywood. You know what I'm saying? They move to Park Avenue and, and you know what I'm saying? They move upstate or wherever they go to, it's a little bit more standoffish in regards to saying, you know what I mean? Right. You know, Fab ain't going to be in Brevoy. <laughs> living. Okay. You know what I mean? So, again, the, the, the dynamic of the, of the support becomes somewhat differentiated when the fan has to think, what exactly am I supporting? What am I empowering? What monster am I creating with my support? You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. You know, bitch, be humble. Like, we, we, we haven't necessarily seen that in because the, the New York art form doesn't allow that. That's not what the New York art form allows. Yeah, that's true. You feel me? That might be true somewhere else, but not necessarily in, in New, New York. York. So... That stigma might be real for the New York artists because this is where you get signed and, and you know what I mean? This is where the artists have to come anyway and get signed. So the majority of the artists that are from here were the ones that were getting signed. Everybody else had to fend for themselves. So they had to create a model that was dependent on, on support. So we wouldn't even be talking about these people if their people had not initially supported them. So we know that that's not true. You feel me? But... You know, when we're talking about us, you know what I mean? That, that, that could be true. That could be true for us. I don't think that uh, millions of New Yorkers was running out to get Jay-Z's album, you know what I mean? Once, once, you know what I mean? Once, once the Bentleys and all of that started breaking out. <laughs> they wanted, you know, we might have went, we definitely was at the concerts. We definitely was showing up at the club and, and we were observing it, you right, feel me? Right, but right, were, right. were we supporting it necessarily? Now, I think that that was more of a cultural phenomenon in regards to everyone else that wants to experience this new level of Americanism. What is the conversation taking place? These niggas is talking about what? Are we one in? We got to pay for that? Are we willing to pay for that? Because we need to know at all times, what are these niggas talking about? You understand? What's this language? What's the conversation? You know, uh, and they're painting pictures. I'm, I can, you know, I can... I could get doped up and take a ride through the hood and I ain't got to be there. So that's what that audio smack is doing. Got one last question for you before we wrap it up. I want to thank, before I ask the question, before I forget, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, all my Patreon members for showing support to Brother Rich Independent Media. Very important. You know, sometimes these platforms, they censor and they play games with what they want you to say. And there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. So I appreciate the people that support me via PayPal and um, also uh, on Patreon. Uh, and with that, and by, you know, it's 12 sometimes just to give them a little behind the scenes. It's, it's 12.25 on a, on a Friday night. So, you know, we put in work Friday night. You know what I'm saying? We, we not outside in the club. Bruh, so we, we <laughs> tell them. We was in here six hours yesterday, last night yeah. until three in the morning doing 444 Dakota just to get home and find out that the, the audio, audio wasn't right. Yeah. So, you know, I had the glasses on. I ain't even on my Hollywood. I had my glasses on because my, my eyes is heavy. You understand? So this is the sacrifices that are being made Indeed. to get this information out. But, um, you know, these stories must be told. Right, right, right. This is just part of what we decided to do. You know, sometimes you go through things like that and you just got to keep it moving. So, you know, we appreciate the more, the, all the positivity that we get from y'all keeps us going. So we definitely appreciate the positivity. Last question. It's late. It's Saturday. I don't want to chop up Black Dot's quote. Black Dot says something along the lines of, when everybody could rap, nobody could rap. Did you hear him say that? I have a general idea of what he what he's he, talking about. Yeah. Elaborate on that when he says, let me say it again. When anybody could rap, nobody could rap. When, when I was young, right, hip-hop was like a fraternal organization you know what i'm saying just like when i was young i remember 
the hustlers was somewhat of a fraternal organization. It might be the same thing with teachers. When anybody could teach, nobody could teach. <laughs> go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. And as I got a little bit old, the lecturers and teachers were a fraternal organization. Okay. And not to spook the audience, I'm saying that we're not we're not saying that they uh, were riding the goat and pledging the Baphomet. I'm saying that there were a select group. Select is the key word here. There were a select group of members of a society that participated in whether it was rapping, hustling, or teaching. You know what I'm saying? And these participants more than likely were chosen and brought in and co-signed by other people of that society to be like, yo, this brother know, you know what I'm saying? This brother's qualified. So with the lyricists, you know, lyricists just ain't come out of nowhere. And they didn't make it through the ranks without getting... You know what I'm saying? That level of cosign or the level of scrutiny to be like, oh, nah, son, you got to go back to the lab. We take this too serious to allow somebody in that is going to disrespect or disregard the culture because that's going to make all of us look bad. So, you know, people started putting up barriers. They started putting up, you know what I mean, hurdles that other people had to cross and clear for them to be like, okay, it's okay for you to be here. All right. At some point in time, you know, I mean, it happened first with the hustler. You know what I'm saying? Because definitely when I was growing up, everybody did not want to be a rapper. That's something that only a select few people wanted to do. It wasn't the coolest thing to be at that particular time. And, you know, you're part of the audience. You're like, look, there's a lot of other things that I can do in this genre. Okay? Hip hop has five elements to it. So you can write graph. You can... um break dance you know what i'm saying you can dj you can mc or you can be you know that knowledge dispenser you could be doing the knowledge you know what i'm saying and then there's managerial aspects you can be the stylist um you can be the record boy you feel me there's a lot of different things and then when it yeah when it and, and when the whole industry aspect of it opened up you can be the a and r you know what i'm saying you could work at the label being an intern you know, there's a lot of different avenues and ways that you could participate in the culture without being the quote-unquote artist, right? And that's what people were aiming for, to, to get in where they fit in, you know? And at some point, when they started removing the OGs out of the game on the street level, and then everybody all of a sudden wanted to be hustlers, then there was an intersection between the streets and, 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 and rap, you know what I'm saying, where raps, all of a sudden the rappers became cool, and then the hustlers wanted to be rappers, and then the rappers wanted to be hustlers, and they started this interchange or this intermarriage of personas and what have you, and then that's when it started spilling over. And then now with the advent of the computer, you know, and the, the, the level of niceness is so low, right? The bar has been set so low that everybody is like, oh, if this is a quick lick, you know what I'm saying? If you could come in here and get some bread and, you know, churn up and go from city to city and, you know what I'm saying, knock down groupies or, you know, live that life that sounds so fun to have been captivated by my entire life and about, about hearing about these other rappers and their, their, esca their escapades and shit. I might be able to get a biopic like Tupac. Yeah. You know, and everything else I'm being told in society is I'm a piece of shit and there's no chance for me to do X, Y, and Z anyway. I just got to have a hot 16, right? Big said, either you're slinging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot, you know what I'm saying? Or you spit. So that became the, uh, you know, the, 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 the designated... Um, That became people's aim and focus. And everybody started picking up microphones and thinking, you know, if 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 I sound remotely nice to myself in the mirror or my, you know what I'm saying, my baby mama and them tell me that I'm sounding nice or what have you, you know what I mean? I got a shot, you know? And then you can listen to the current crop of artists now and you can see how this is manifest you know what i'm saying they haven't really taken the time to hone their craft they haven't really necessarily came up around anybody that you know 
was an authoritarian in regards to saying, look, you know, you've put in X amount of hours studying this. You know what I'm saying? You've perfected that. You know, I think that you're ready, son. Like, there's no more of that. You know, there's no more of that in the street game. You know, it don't even seem like there's not too much of that in, in the athleticism. There's not too much of it in rap, you know. That's who we are as a people at this particular time. And it shows in everything that we do. All right? Give me contact info. Contact info, brother. Blue Pillar 44, all right? On IG, apparelnormal.com. Uh, Soul Go Biz, S O L E G O L D B I Z dot com. Shots to Medicine dot com. All right. Um, download the Know the Ledge app. K N O W T H E L E D G E. Know the Ledge app. That's where we're going to be debuting the 444 decoded. It will be available sometime next week. It's going to be exclusively streamed on the Know the Ledge Know the Ledge app. You could go to the Google Store. You could go to the Apple Store. It's available in both of them places. All right? Know the Ledge app. Get the Know the Ledge app. You're going to get this 444 decoded. We'll go into the metaphysical, metaphysical, <laughs> the meta metaphysical, astrological, cosmological, Aspects of hip hop as it relates to this 44th year of its inception. Okay, it's definitely going to be interesting and entertainment. Peace, love, and light. Thank you for your time and your attention. Peace, family. Peace, peace, family. This is brother Rich from UGR, urging all my viewers and subscribers to help support the channel by donating just one dollar to the UGR PayPal account. We appreciate the viewership and support, and we understand the power of a dollar. If you benefit in any way, shape, or form, we ask that you donate a dollar, whether it be monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, or yearly, so that we can build our brand to compete with the NBCs, the MTVs, and the Foxes of the world. I figure since Kanye could ask Mark Zuckerberg for one billion, I could ask my subscribers to donate one dollar so I could make the best possible content possible. The main objective of this channel is to inspire you to become the greatest version of yourself. So hopefully throughout the years of you watching this program, you have been inspired to become the greatest version of yourself. If you would like to donate, you could go to www.paypal.com and send a donation to richandmerit7 at yahoo.com. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your program.